These are the clockwork chambers. Every one of these rooms are generated from up to 17 base levels, where each level can spawn different items at different places, picked randomly. This dungeon can have over 55 billion different combinations. Here is how I did it. Hey there friends, I'm Leo, and today I'm going to go over how the procedural dungeons are working on Spark Mods. I know it's been kind of a long time since I last uploaded my last devlog, but there's a very good reason for that. For the last couple of months, I have been very hard at work doing some level design for this dungeon over here, as well as playing around with enemy AI and optimization. I had a bunch of setbacks with the plugin I was using, then some setbacks with the new one, and also a lot of other miscellaneous problems along the way. It was a whole thing. But now I can very safely say that I have a very good idea on what a final vertical slice for the game would be like. I will discuss all of that in the closed alpha at the end of this video, so stay tuned. Ever since I pivoted the game a little while ago to a more procedural path, I wanted to have a procedural dungeon system. Something kind of similar to The Binding of Isaac. The concept idea for this is that these clockwork chambers would be the insides of the mechanical dragon, and you would find entrances to this place around the dragon biome. I was inspired by stuff like the Dwemer ruins from the Elder Scrolls, or the goblins and gnomes from World of Warcraft. So when first entering these clockwork chambers, you would find rare mineral nodes, treasures, and the enemies would be fish bots, similar to the ones that you already saw and the ones that you are going to see in town. The lore for this is that the master engineer that created the Wandering Dragon and moved away from civilization into this kind of city in the sky, similar to Bioshock, for example. So this guy had a brother, and his brother was a scientist, and he liked to do some experiments using fish, and he wanted to make smart fish, well, at least smart enough, to the point where they could serve as workers, and help around with some maintenance stuff inside of this wandering dragon, something like the big daddies in Bioshock. So the first ever versions of these fish bots were the piranha that he used, which are not friendly. They are there to work and if they see you, they're going to attack. And these are the enemies that you're going to see. Well, the, the, they're going to be the main bulk of the enemies that you're going to see when you are in the clockwork chambers. There are some other enemies that you're going to find, like the oil crabs that are going to be walking around in hot oil. And there are a lot of other kind of ideas that I have, but I'm not really sure about sharing it right now. Those two are going to be 100% in the game and I already know what I'm going to do with them, so, you know. Since I am a solo developer making a very, very big project, I need all the help I can get. So I went to look if I could find any plugins that would help me generate a Binding of Isaac style dungeon. I ended up finding a really good free plugin that uses individual pieces of a level to generate a dungeon with any parameters you want. The way this works is you make a level and place all of your geometry and actors inside of the bounds that the plugin makes for you. From there, you can use the dungeon actor to generate a dungeon from the preset of levels you feed it. I had some trouble in having the level design really resonate with what I wanted from the concept from when I first had the idea of the clockwork chambers in my head. It took a couple of different tests and a bunch of different tries with different lighting conditions and different materials, but I was finally able to have something that clicks with me. I think this was the first time that I was actually doing some level design, thinking about the composition of an area or some hidden areas or where the player's attention should be at at different points during his playthrough. I'm quite happy with the vibe of this dungeon, but it wasn't exactly what I had in mind when I was first imagining it a couple of months back. This dungeon plugin works really well if you have a smaller project or you really know your way around C++, because it is really customizable and you can really expand on the logic the author used. My main issue with it is that if this is a free plugin, the author has literally no obligation to make any updates for it whatsoever, so when Unreal 5 releases, I could be left completely hanging. Since SparkMuts is a very, very big part of my life, and I already spent one year and a half working on this, thousands of hours, and I plan on working on this for many more years to come, 
So I really need something that is very reliable and very safe. Something that I would basically know that I would have support for the long term. As well as a Discord server to help me out if I have any issues with the plugin. What I found is this spectacular plugin called Dungeon Architect, which is very similar to Voxel plugin. Both are really expensive and incredibly well made. Now, just to reiterate, I am not talking trash on the free plugin, not at all. It is a great solution, just as much as Dungeon Architect, but I feel a lot more comfortable investing into something that will give me safety on a long-term project, such as SparkMuds. One very cool thing about this Dungeon Architect plugin is that they provide you with a bunch of different ways to generate a dungeon. You can generate it based on this theme file, which contains your walls, your floors, your ceilings, all from your own base meshes. Then it is going to generate a completely procedural dungeon. I started playing around with that at the beginning, but I feel it makes my dungeon feel a little bit empty. I wanted something that is a little bit more handmade with some platforming and some hidden areas. Luckily, they have just the right solution for that. In fact, they have two ways that you can go about generating this sort of dungeon. You can either make a single floor dungeon based on preset levels in a very similar way to this free plugin. This solution also gives you a built-in minimap with a minimap material. Or you can make a multi-floor dungeon that has the potential of being a lot more complex. The only problem with that is that this multi-floor dungeon does not have a built-in minimap. From what I saw on the Discord server, it seems that you can make it work using C++. You can override a function and make the minimap work on a multi-floor dungeon. But I don't know C++ all that well yet. I just used C Sharp a long while ago when I was using Unity. I've been wanting to learn C++ for a couple of months now, and I think this is the perfect opportunity for me to learn it and to implement something new in this plugin. But anyway, this is the method that I am using. It's called Snap Grid Flow. With this method, you can use this graph to plan out the paths and items your dungeon is going to contain. In here, you can generate custom paths and where you want them to start or to end. This way, you can pretty much make any sort of dungeon based on your own rules, all just using this one graph. It also has this really nice debug dungeon, so you can really see what you're doing, from extra paths to items that you are going to spawn on the room. And since we are on this topic, you can spawn items at random points inside of every room using this grid flow graph. But to be able to do that, you need to create and place a thing called a marker on each one of the rooms. Markers indicate a possible area that an object can spawn in. So you'd place a bunch of markers and the dungeon builder would decide which ones would spawn based on what you set on this graph. But you still gotta use this graph over here with your meshes and on this graph is where you connect what actor you want to spawn, just linking them with this name that you're going to put on the marker. But I kinda ran into a problem with markers. Um, I already sent it over to the guy on the Discord server and he already reported that as a bug and he's working on fixing that. But as of right now, my solution that I found was to make my own custom marker. So, first of all, my problem was that if I try to position or to spawn 20 different markers, it doesn't work, it just glitches out and crashes Unreal. So, if I try to spawn 19, it works fine but just the arbitrary number of trying to spawn something like 20 or kind of a high number like that because I think this is a system that was more intended for you to have three or four kind of markers to spawn different enemies. But I, I have these wooden boxes in the map and these wooden boxes I want to spawn like 20 on each room. So it is something that it is a lot harder to spawn using the dungeon builder. So here comes my idea. Um, what if I made my own marker that was independent of the dungeon builder and was kind of self-sufficient and they would be able to micromanage themselves. This would remove some load on the dungeon when being generated and then every marker would manage itself to decide if it should load or not. So inside of the custom marker you just gotta specify what is the chance of this spawning in percentages and what is the actor that it should spawn. I also made a debug box that also just draws a little area so that you can know 
what is the size of the actor that you are placing on the map. At first, I was very scared that this is going to kill performance, but it ended up running surprisingly well. It barely has any difference than just using markers, and honestly, I think it's even faster because it takes a lot of the load out of the dungeon builder, I think. And with that, I spent a good 3 to 4 weeks just making new levels, all with hidden nooks and crannies that is going to contain treasure chests. It's still to be added in the game. Doing the math here, we have four types of starting areas that are going to culminate into eight main path rooms and 14 side path rooms, with a little variation on more and less. Each one of these rooms will have 17 possible types. If we multiply each one, we have an absurd number like 55 billion combinations of dungeons that this can generate. It is a big number for sure, but I think that you can still kind of see that you're on the same kind of archetype of room and I was able to see that I saw the same kind of room on the same dungeon so I think I need to at least double the amount of kind of rooms that can be generated for that to actually be a lot more procedural and feel a lot more unique. Now one really cool thing that I learned that I wanted to share is the fake interior materials. You know when you're playing Spider-Man on the PS4 and you stop on a building and you see kind of the interiors of it? Well, that is not an actual geometry, that is just a material that is kind of a fake geometry, and that is called an interior cube map. I used a bunch of these, layered in with some flipbook materials to make some very cool architectural pieces for the clockwork chambers, and I think it looks very cool and you barely notice it. I mean, I think that now that I told you and um, it, that you know it is just a plane, you kind of can see it, but... I feel like if you're just walking around, it kind of blends in and feels more natural and feels more alive, especially with the flipbook materials. Now, on most games, the first time that you program a mechanic is most likely not final. A lot of times you have to refactor and remake a lot of coding and a lot of the, the different mechanics in your game to make them work better because you found a better solution, because you learned something new, especially in solo dev. I would say that the first year of development of Spark Mutts was pretty much just prototyping because I was first getting a grasp at the concept and what was my final idea and my final vision and what I want the game to be. Just conceptualizing the idea into an actual game. The actual final content started being produced once I revamped the player model, I think. And saying that, I now have a much better solution for dropping scrap on the game. Scrap is basically the currency that you use to buy things in town and will drop from boxes around dungeons and other areas. Originally, my idea was to have a bunch of them on the screen, much like Ratchet and Clank. I tried spawning actors that would flow towards the player and that dropped a lot from my FPS. I also tried using particles, both with Niagara and Cascade, but I lacked control on the blueprint side of things. What ended up working was instance hierarchical static meshes. I basically spawn a bunch of instances of one mesh and I control each one of these in a for loop, making them move closer to the player. This was a very very good solution in terms of performance, but I bet I could make it even better if I made this in C++, thus refactoring the code once again. But I think that C++ really helps if you have like a for loop with a bunch of nodes clumped together. It just makes it a lot more fast or faster, I guess. 
But at least we know that for now these boxes are not gonna kill your FPS. One other thing that I refactored a little bit is the two-handed action bar system that I had in mind. The whole point of the action bar system that had two hands was for it to be a nice addition that truly adds room to experiment without taking away player freedom. The system I ended up making was very convoluted and would end up being a bad addition to the game because it has a lot of these little rules that I don't even know if I could make into an actual player tutorial. For example, if you can hold um, a lamp on your left hand but you cannot hold a weapon on your left hand and you need to have a first a weapon on your right hand before you can actually hold a gun on your left hand. So even programming all of these strange rules would be a pain in the ass. So this system was kind of a curse on the game instead of a blessing. It was just one action bar where you had to micromanage each hand and by holding Q you could control what your left hand would hold. And even just trying that out, I remember I got very confused multiple times as to what I was holding on what hand. So that wasn't that much of a good system, honestly. The new two hands action bar focuses completely on freedom. You can equip any weapon or tool on any hand that you feel like, with animations all being automatically mirrored on the other side. The only case where one hand can overwrite the other is when you equip a two-handed tool, like a drill. And then the animations also get mirrored for that. I am also going to implement all the one-handed combo animations now mirrored on the left hand, so you will be able to execute combos regardless of what hand you choose as your weapon hand. With this, the system became kind of a blessing on the game that always holds player freedom in high regard, so now you, instead of having 10 inventory slots in your action bar, you actually have 20, so it leaves you a lot more room to plan ahead and to actually organize your stuff, and you don't have to be opening the inventory all the time. And we also have all of the main features that was the main reason for me to make the system, which is dual wielding weapons or dual wielding guns or having one melee weapon and a gun. I think that all of that would be very cool and very unique. I, I don't think I ever saw that, something that was kind of this freeing and uh, I don't know, I just, I just like it. Now, since we were talking about two-handed drills, I also re-implemented the mining system. The first system was relying on a bunch of meshes that would swap between themselves as the rock would lose more and more health. So the first idea was very dumb. It was just not practical at all and basically took more effort for something that didn't even make that great of a difference. This time around I have a material that gradually cracks the mesh like in Minecraft and this is good enough to illustrate that you are breaking the node. While developing spark mutts, I'm getting better and better at prioritizing what is actually important versus what I just kind of think it's cool and definitely not worth the investment right now. For example, when I started making the clockwork chambers using the dungeon architect plugin, um, I wanted the dungeon to start on an elevator. And then each floor could have optional paths that would lead you into these big corridors that you could go to get some extra loot. That was a really cool idea, but imagine the amount of time I would have to spend in designing the elevator and the implications that this would have in the final game. With you just having to go back all the way that you came from just to reach the elevator and then to go down a floor and then having to go all the way up again and then go back to the elevator, I feel like that would be very exhausting and wouldn't be very fun to explore a dungeon that was very linear at the same time that was kind of non-linear with the multi-floor, I think you guys can see what I'm getting at here. Would that really be that worth it for me to waste like a full month of my time doing something that would even hurt the game in my opinion? I don't really think so. So I scrapped that idea entirely, it is just not worth the time investment. Looking back now at things that I made like the combat pets, I see now that I was prioritizing stuff that wasn't very important to the game's development at the time, seeing how I didn't even have a health bar on the player. And speaking of player health, I finally, finally implemented it. These hearts work similarly to Zelda. When taking damage, enemies will chip away pieces of these hearts. So the enemy AI is working, but it completely lacks polish, which will probably be the focus for the next devlog. 
Oh, and I also added player stamina, but I'm thinking on removing it because it's just not fun to run out of stamina. But then again, this could be a thing that the player could work towards leveling up, getting more stamina and being able to run for longer periods of time. Now, let's talk a bit about my future plans and the playtest that I just started on Steam. So the public alpha is very, very close. I think that at least in December, I can kind of open it up for everyone that wants to play it. But for now, I'm going to be slowly giving away keys for people that want it on Discord. I even created a new chat just for talking about the playtest. And I'm also going to be accepting people on the actual playtest on the Steam page. So go there and subscribe there and um, you can be accepted. I think you're going to get like an email and the game is going to automatically be on your Steam library. And I'm also going to be giving away 5 keys as soon as this video goes up. So hop on there on the Discord server and grab yourself some keys. My roadmap for this year is to mostly finish this dungeon with a final boss maybe and some treasure chests. Then I want to go back to the Mac Dragon, add a building system, crafting and re-implement the tree cutting mechanic. So um, I just want the game to be fun enough that you can spend a couple of hours maybe playing if you want to like build something. So I feel like that is my, my goal as a vertical slice for the game in December. So I got a lot of stuff to do before December. I really want to do something like in Subnautica where the game slowly grows with the audience and it kind of builds itself up, it has an early access, and as soon as you know it, the game is released, it's releasing a second one, so I kind of really like the road that Subnautica went to, and um, I kind of want to try to do something like that with Spark Mods. If you guys have any cool ideas you want to add, comment them down below. Also, don't forget to add the game to your wishlist on Steam, um, and join the Discord. It's great, wonderful people there, and you can get some keys. You have yourself a wonderful day, I'm Leo, signing off.